Hello, and welcome to the first part of a two-part series on Cybersecurity Today. I'm Jim Wiggins, your host. We appreciate you joining us as we delve into the fascinating field of system security engineering and cyber resiliency. Now, let's talk about today's show. Cybersecurity Today is a half-hour show adopting a hybrid talk show newscast format to converse about trends, themes, and the latest happenings in the realm of cybersecurity. If you're new to the subject, this show is your gateway to understanding how to safeguard and defend information systems. For our viewers, who are seasoned practitioners like myself, we offer insight from leading cyber experts on the future trajectory of the cybersecurity industry. We're committed to delivering valuable information to a broad spectrum of audiences with diverse interests. We've divided our show into two distinct segments for your convenience. Our opening segment, aptly titled Cyberbytes, covers a wide range of topical events currently shaping the cybersecurity industry. Following that, our second segment features a guest speaker renowned in the field of cybersecurity. Today, we have the pleasure of having Dr. Ron Ross, a fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. He'll be sharing his insights on system security engineering and cyber resiliency within the context of a couple of NIST special publications, specifically 800-160 volumes one and two. If you're unfamiliar with these guidelines, they represent crucial resources for federal, state, local governments, and even contractors, and also for the United States critical infrastructure. We're eager to hear from Dr. Ross's expertise on how these standards and guidance influence system security, engineering, and also cyber resiliency, which are core to maintaining the nation's security. Let's move on to our first segment, Cyber Bytes. In cybercrime news, several US state agencies, banks, universities, and even energy giant Shell are the latest victims of the Move It hack orchestrated by a group known as CLOP. While this cybersecurity attack has impacted numerous institutions, including Boots, British Airways, and BBC, Director of the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Ms. Jen Easterly, assured that it's not posing a systemic risk like the SolarWinds hack of 2021. Despite the extent of the attack, the hackers appear to be opportunistic rather than strategic in their targets. The breach was made possible through a vulnerability in the file transfer service, MoveIt, uh, an issue the company has claimed to address promptly upon discovery the total number of U.S. victims could potentially reach into the hundreds or thousands. This is a developing story with significant international implications. We'll continue to follow it closely. In other news, the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, or CISA, has released updated guidelines to bolster cloud cybersecurity within U.S. federal agencies. These fresh resources offer vital aid to public and private entities, encouraging best practices in cloud cybersecurity. This is a part of CISA's Secure Cloud Business Applications Project, aiming to protect sensitive data by providing mandatory minimum system specifications. Amidst concerns of evolving cyber threat capabilities, these guidelines aim to plug cybersecurity and visibility gaps to better manage cyber risk a timely move as some federal departments have recently been found inconsistent in implementing required security standards. That covers a lot of the current events that are happening today in the cybersecurity industry. We're gonna take a quick break and we come back, we're gonna be joined by Dr. Ron Ross from the National Institute of Standards and Technology to talk about system security engineering and cyber resiliency. We look forward to seeing you in just a moment. As an American, I'm proud of the men and women in our armed forces who every day protect our freedom. That's why I'm also proud to support Help Hospitalize Veterans. 
a nonprofit organization that offers veterans free therapeutic arts and craft kits specially designed to help them in their recuperation. The kits can also help veterans coping with depression or PTSD. To receive a free kit, call this number or visit hhv.org on the web. Thank you. Welcome back to Cybersecurity Today. Now we are pleased to introduce Dr. Ron Ross from the National Institute of Standards and Technology, sometimes known as NIST, for our second segment. It's an honor to have you, Dr. Ross. Hey, Jim, it's great to be back with you. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So, Dr. Ross, I know that I know who you are and everyone in cyber knows who you are, but this show is actually broadcast in the Washington DC area on the local cable stations. So undoubtedly some people are gonna be watching that may be new to cyber. Can we start by having you talk a little bit about your background at NIST in developing standards, guidance uh, around cyber for the past 25 plus years? Sure, be happy to do that. Uh, I actually came to NIST in 1997. It's hard to believe it's been uh, that long now, but it's it, at that point I'd, I'd been in the military for uh, 20, almost 21 years, and I took a short uh, hi hiatus in the private sector for about almost four years. And then I came to work for NIST in 1997. And for those of folks who don't know uh, NIST, uh, NIST is a, a, a non-regulatory agency that's part of the Department of Commerce. Uh, some of our sister organizations are the Census Bureau uh, and uh, things of that nature, uh, the NOAA organization. And, and so we are one of those uh, sub uh, agencies under the Department of Commerce. And the primary, NIST has a wide portfolio. We have a lot of bench scientists that deal with physics and building and fire research and chemistry. We've had, uh, I think, three or four Nobel Prize winning physicists over the years. My particular laboratory, among all the labs at NIST, uh, we're the information technology laboratory. And that's, that houses all of the cybersecurity talent, if you will, uh, that are part of NIST. They're broken down into two divisions. One is called the Computer Security Division, and the other is the Applied Cybersecurity Division. They're both headed up by division chiefs. They have different missions, but uh, I am part of the Computer Security Division responsible for developing the core standards and guidelines for the federal government that they need to uh, implement or satisfy to comply with legislation such as FISMA, the Federal Information Security Management Act, which most of your uh, viewers might have heard of. Uh, we also, uh, our standards and guidelines are used to comply with Office of Man Management Budget policy as well. And so I've been doing it since 1997. I started out working on the common criteria, which is international cybersecurity standard. I then moved into the FISMA project, which uh, as you know, has everything from the risk management framework to the uh, NIST 853 control catalog, all the assessment procedures. I've worked on the 800-171 series, which is the protection of controlled unclassified information a huge uh, deal right now with the DOD's uh, CMMC program that they're building. And then more recently, around 2014, for the past decade, I had a parallel track and I started working on uh, system security engineering guidelines. Uh, and I know you and I have talked a lot about that. I, I kind of characterize my work in the engineering space as kind of below the waterline, below the surface of the ocean. There's a lot of stuff that's going on that you really can't see. That's where all the hardware, the software, and the firmware components reside. A lot of cybersecurity either is going to live or die based on what we do below the waterline. So that's been my passion for the past uh, for the past decade. So with that being said, can you talk a little bit about system security engineering and really like why is it so important? Why, from a cyber perspective, do we care about building security into our products? Well, I guess the short answer is, is that today we're living in a world that is unbelievably advancing in technology. I mean, when, I've been doing this for 30 years and I go back 50 years in my first uh, job that I had. And if you could look back at the start of that 50 years and where we've come, even the past 10 years, there's been such rapid advancements in smartphone technology and, and all the things from supercomputers, supercomputers to, the, to the smallest sensors and smartphones, all of that uh, represents com complex systems because there are literally trillions of lines of code out there today. There are billions, with a B, devices. 
and they're all connected over ubiquitous networks. We're all connected to everything. And if you couple that with what we call the, the cyber physical convergence of systems, you know, back in the old days, if your computer failed, you would get the blue screen of death, they called it. And that was bad. You had to reboot your system and do some stuff, but nobody died. Today, our computing technology is embedded in everything we care about, from smart, from pacemakers to power plants. And the fact that those computers now are controlling physical systems, a failure on the computer side, the, com the computer side of that house that drives, it's the smarts that drives the, the physical systems, a failure on that side can cause severe catastrophic effects for human beings and society in general. It's, a good example is the brakes in your automobile. Uh, it used to be that our computers were really focused on the entertainment system in the car. Now we have literally dozens of safety systems that are driven by those computers. And so if there's a vulnerability in any of those software components that are part of those devices that are driving those critical safety systems, that failure can literally cause a car's brakes to stop working. And obviously the results could be catastrophic. So it's that complexity and how you deal with that complexity in a world that it continues to innovate. Innovation is how we roll in the United States and around the world now. We don't want to stop innovation, but we want to innovate so what we're producing that our consumers are using, they can do it safely and securely. And that's really why engineering is so important because you can't solve those problems above the waterline. You've got to go down where the software, the hardware, and the firmware components are built, developed, and tested and evaluated to make sure you're getting quality components as well as a, a procedure to put all those things together in a secure fashion. So you've used the term system security engineering and also talked about system engineering. Can you talk about the relationship between the two of those? Are they the same thing or are they different? Are they complements? Maybe you could speak about that for a moment. The, the really SSC or system security engineering is a sub-discipline of systems engineering. If you were to look at systems engineering as the overarching, uh, the macro level view of the engineering process where you're trying to build something, no matter what it is, uh, system engineers are called in to build the system. There's an outcome that you're desiring. So there are stakeholders involved, and they want to they want to have a certain capability of that system, and and then they turn to the engineers and say, okay, you build it. Well, the engineers have expertise in life cycle development processes, but there are various specialties they need to bring in to ensure that they get the outcomes they're desiring. So, in the case of a system security engineer. That would be an engineer by trade, but also schooled, has the knowledge, skills, and abilities, if you will, in, this, in the security area, the, the information security, computer security area, to sit as part of the engineering team and advise that team on how to build a system, not only that can put steel on target and works, but also one that's adequately protected so adversaries can't bring down your critical capability when you really need to have it. That's a great point. Uh, and I know that there's, uh, for a lot of organizations, you know, when they build systems, a lot of times security gets kind of thought about after the fact, right? We've oftentimes, uh, you know, been so focused on the functionality and the, the, the needs of the organization. Can you speak to a minute about how SSE tries to address that particular paradigm that we've had for so many years in IT and ultimately the cyber environment? Sure, the best analogy I can give is I have a, a metaphor is called the black box. When, when you look at your smartphone or a tablet or even a supercomputer, it, for most of people looking at that from the outside, your interface with that is the, the user interface. You really don't know what's going on inside that black box. Now, for decades, we've had a lot of work going on in cybersecurity with our frameworks and our controls and all the things we've been doing. But a lot of that is done by the consumers above the waterline, developing a risk assessment or a contingency plan or putting in two-factor authentication or access controls. All those are encryption. All those things are great things to do, but it doesn't really tell you how those functions are operating below the waterline inside those uh, system components. <clears throat> so when we talk about the importance of uh, systems engineering or, or system security engineering or software engineering, we're talking about how those components are actually built. They, they have a set of requirements that they're building to, 
And you want to make sure that if the vendor who's built that component and makes a claim that this product does X, Y, or Z, well, how do I know the way you built the product, if it was to specification, and what kind of evidence can you bring forward to assure me that you built what you said you were going to do? You made a claim, and now we want to substantiate that. So you can go on forever in buying commercial products off the shelf and put them together in a system. But unless and until we understand how those component products are built, what's inside, a lot of this work's going on now in the SBOM, the Software Bill of Materials project, where we're trying to get greater transparency with the industry so we can understand what they've done, if they've applied secure coding techniques, if they're using best practices and putting components together to ensure we're reducing our susceptibility uh, to those adversarial attacks. You can't get that with just off-the-shelf components and throwing things together. You've got to have a disciplined process, life cycle based, that goes through everything from the stakeholders weighing in what they want, and then at some point they turn it over to the engineers, they say, okay, time for you guys to build it, and then when you're done, I want to make sure two things. It's built correctly, and secondly, uh, it's fit for purpose, that it can actually do what the system needs to do. Those are two very important things that have to be outcomes, outputs of the life cycle process. So that's why uh, SSE and SE in general are critical components that we just haven't focused enough on to this point in time. So can you talk then briefly about the two core documents that you've been on a mission for the last probably 10 years, focused around 800-160, Rev one, volume one, and, 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 and volume two. Um, I think that that kind of leads nicely into your discussion about SSE and SE, but would love to really kind of maybe spend a few minutes talking about 160 and how it kinds of addresses some of these issues that you're talking about. Sure. Back when I first came into cybersecurity, it was 1990, my first assignment was the National Security Agency. That's when I was still in the military. And the NSA back in those days, they did a, a lot of work on system security engineering. They were concerned about what kind of component products got built. They had the old trusted product evaluation program where they would define requirements for trusted operating systems. Vendors would build those. They would go through a testing and evaluation process and they would get rated and then put onto a list. So customers could have assurance when they bought those, they had some level of protection and they could be assured of that, uh, that those levels of protection. Well. That program uh, came to a halt uh, in the mid-1990s, and then commercial industry was off on its own, building and innovating and producing you know, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of products for systems and, and all the components that people were using to build those systems. And at some point, um, after my work on the risk management framework and all the security controls, I started to think about, well, how can we take some of that original work the NSA had been working on and, and propagating back uh, in the 80s and the 90s and bring that forward into more of a 21st century context. And the way we chose to do that is we first of all look for an international standard on systems engineering. And we found one, it was ISO 15288. Uh, it was an international standard for systems and software engineering. And lo and behold, it defined uh, a life cycle process. There were 30 different uh, stages of the life cycle or process steps in the life cycle that the, uh, the that standard defined. 14 of those were the classic life cycle processes that deal more with the technical development. And then the other 16 processes focused on more of the things that surround a life cycle process, risk management, uh, program management, things that you need to do to kind of make sure the project, uh, you know, adheres to cost schedule and performance uh, issues. And that was our basis. And we couldn't, we didn't want to copy the international standard because it already existed and it was a good standard. So we decided to take every one of those process steps, all 30, and we define the security considerations that were associated with every one of those process steps. So now, if you're a systems engineer and you're building a new system or a major upgrade, you can go to that international standard and then you can go to the NIST 800-160 volume one and you can correlate the two. So if you are on let's say the stakeholder uh, requirements uh, step in that life cycle process. You can go to the NIST document 800 and you can find a corresponding stakeholder requirements uh, security considerations chapter and that will give you everything you need to know as a systems engineer on how to address the security aspects of the stakeholder requirements step. 
And we do that throughout the entire life cycle. Uh, in addition to that, we brought forward over 40 years worth of, I would call it best practices in security design principles and trust, trusted computing principles, things that the NSA and industry started working back on in the 80s, but were never really carried forward through the 90s into the 21st century. So that was kind of a lost couple of decades of very critical material and work. And our job was to bring it back into the 21st century, uh, explain what it is, why it's important, and then help people use the concepts in the document to build more trustworthy, secure system. Uh, that was volume one. Uh, volume two followed after that and had to do with cyber resiliency. Uh, every, that's the buzzword that's on the top of everybody's mind today. Uh, we've, we've discovered over the past, uh, I think, five years, maybe, maybe a little longer than that, that our original dream was to be able to have systems that were strong enough uh, penetration resistance-wise to stop all adversaries. If you were doing it right, you'd stop them all. Turns out that's not a, a good bet anymore because the adversaries, number one, they innovate as well. They're clever. They have lots of resources, especially nation states that they're using to go against our entire supply chain, our federal agencies, our universities. And so we have to be good all the time. And, and, and we found out that you know if they want to get in, they can. So we had to look at not just stopping them at the front door, but dealing with them once they got inside the house. And that's really what the whole cyber resiliency guideline is all about. How do you deal with adversaries, assuming they're going to get into your system? And, 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 and how do we do that in a way that that system can continue to operate, even if it's in a, a degraded or debilitated state, after that breach has occurred? So with all that being said, I'd like to kind of delve into some of the elements within 800-160. There's a focus on, well, there's some discussion around trust, trustworthiness, and assurance. And I was wondering if you could kind of talk to for a moment what that means from the organization's perspective. Are, do they represent the same thing? Why are they important? And, and maybe how do they differ? Well, the words are very common words, but depending on where you sit, those words can mean different things. So to the engineers who are using 80160, uh, the focus is on, uh, when we talk about trust and trustworthiness, um, you and I can trust each other to various degrees and sometimes you can trust a person and your trust is misplaced. So when we talk about trustworthiness, we're talking about when you go to build a system, you're, the, the stakeholders have a certain set of requirements and, and they're going to have claims that as you go through that system process, you're going to claim that certain requirements have been met and the system performs a certain way. But trustworthiness is about all the things that you bring forward to the, we call it evidence, to demonstrate that those requirements actually have been met and the outcomes will be achieved. So the level of trustworthiness that you, you bring forward is based on a lot of different factors. There, there are things that you can do in the testing and evaluation world. There's design analysis. There are all kinds of uh, components that go into building a trustworthy system or a system that uh, you can trust. So, the whole idea of 8160 is that that level of trustworthiness is a byproduct of the design and development process. So when you're done, you can not only say that this system is trustworthy, but you can say, and here's why that is true. Here's the evidence that I can show you through every step in that life cycle. Here's the design. Uh, here are the, the, the way we, we, did, we did the secure coding techniques, and here's the type of things that we did to make that system as secure as it needs to be. Now, a lot of times in the world today, when you buy a commercial product off the shelf, there's not a lot of information for consumers out there. So we, we basically are flying by the seat of our pants today, putting some of these components into the systems that are going into critical, critical systems. Uh, this could be an air traffic control system. It could be a, um, a, a weapon system, a, a, an F-35 uh, fighter, so, or a power plant, a PLC in a power plant. And so the idea, and that ties to the, the, the term assurance, is assurance is really the justified grounds for confidence that, that you can trust an entity to do what it's supposed to do. We're trying to bring those concepts to the forefront because without those concepts being articulated in an engineering-based process, we can't have the transparency and the visibility we need to make credible risk-based decisions. And 
while that might not be important for every you know day-to-day -day things around your house you know some of the smart devices fail around your house it's not a catastrophe but if some of these computing devices fail on a power plant or a pacemaker or an automobile or you could just roll off the critical systems where this technology is so deeply embedded today we need to do better to make sure that we convey that evidence to the customers as consumers all of us have a right to know how much risk we're taking when these systems are being put into play. And the only way we can do that is to build better components, better designs, better development processes, and the most important thing, some way to carry the evidence forward and convey that to the consumers in a way they can understand. Uh, you know, we have labels on all of our food products, and that's kind of a simplified example, but you know, if I'm trying to lose weight and I'm going down the, the grocery store aisle, I'm trying to look at how much fat is in this particular food item or how much cholesterol or what's the sodium level. And so I get an idea as a consumer what things I'm going to buy and what things I, maybe I should stay away from. We don't have any of that in, in, the, in the IT world or, or the systems world. And we need to get moving down the road so we can achieve some of that. Otherwise, none of us want to be flying blind in the world that we're building that's so powerful so innovative and so pervasive in every aspect of our lives. So that concludes the first part of our discussion on system security engineering and cyber resiliency. Join us next time for part two of our discussion with Dr. Ron Ross. Don't forget to check out our website for updates on future episodes at www.cybersecuritytoday.org. If you'd like to send us a comment or a question, please reach out to us at contact us at cybersecuritytoday.org. Until then, stay safe and stay informed. Until then, thank you.